my sincerest apologies for this commentary coming up a little late this week, but we have got so much to talk about. I decided today that I better wait until after NXT Unstoppable before I do a commentary because I want to talk about Kevin Owens and John Cena, so I kind of wanted to wait to see if he was still going to be the champion after the show. And plus, if anything else went down, a lot of you guys were going to want me to comment on it, so I decided to wait until after that. But this is what I'm talking about. The business moves too fast for me. I have to talk about three pay-per-views in this commentary, not to mention a Monday Night Raw, not to mention some other juicy tidbits of news that have been floating around over the last couple of days. And it was a really bad week for me because I was able to see so little of all of this. So as usual, with good mic work, this is going to be a very casual review. And I'm going to look back on everything here. Payback, Monday Night Raw, Unstoppable. Also going to preview the Elimination Spaceship as well. So we have a ton to get into here. I will start right away with NXT Unstoppable because I cannot believe how much positive feedback I have been getting from the show. I had to work all night tonight. As soon as I'm done with this commentary, I will go back and take a closer look at Unstoppable. But I I glanced at it at my phone a couple of times and I saw a few things on the show. But I know all of you are praising the shit out of the in-ring work. Some of you even mentioned the Divas match specifically for me to check out. I know uh, Baron Corbin got on the map beating Rhino tonight. And of course, we had a big debut. Samoa Joe shows up and not only does he show up he keeps the name who saw that coming Samoa Joe's actually going to be called Samoa Joe and not Polynesia Peter or some shit like that To me, that was the most surprising thing about the whole show. It's great to see him in there. I'll tell you, man, NXT is on fire. The WWE has created their own independent company. Not only did they wipe out all the big territories, the NWAs, the AWAs, the UWFs, shit like that, now they're going after the little guy. I mean, they're doing TNA and Ring of Honor better than TNA and Ring of Honor is doing. And as a matter of fact, I don't know, you guys have all heard the rumors. A lot of you told me on Twitter and Facebook, apparently is Destination America canceling TNA Impact already? Are they already pulling the plug on that? Holy shit, they probably took one look at NXT TakeOver tonight and said, oh, we're fucked. What the hell are we even trying to do here? These guys are doing our job better than we are. And it's true, you know, fans that like what NXT provides are the same type of fans that like what Ring of Honor and TNA can give them. And I'll tell you, the WWE is doing wrestling on the independent level. They've created their own, and it's unbelievable. You got Samoa Joe and Kevin Owens front and center. You know, that's probably going to be their big feud their main feud now. Any independent company would love to have those guys feuding for their world title, and they're in the WWE. They're in the performance center, for fuck's sake. It's just, I can't say enough good things about uh, the WWE and NXT and what they've done. I mean, a little bit of it, you know, you can look at it and say, well, WWE's just trying to corner another market, and they're trying to put a chokehold on the entire wrestling industry, and now they are completely cleaning out the independence of anybody that's left. Anybody out there that made a name for themselves outside of the WWE, they're all coming in now. Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, we've seen Daniel Bryan, a lot of other guys as well. You know, it's going to get to the point where there's going to be nobody else out there. Once somebody even starts to get good, they're going to sign a developmental contract with WWE and go to NXT. So it's going to be very hard, I think, for guys to make a name for themselves on the independent level or in Japan or in Mexico or anywhere else because now the WWE is doing that and a lot of guys are going to want to go over there. So in a way, it's just them preparing for the future. In a way, I think it's just Triple H, especially and WWE and Vince saying, you know, we don't want to have to go through and pick and choose and negotiate with guys that made a big name for themselves, you know, on the independent level. And, you know, we want to create all this ourselves. They want to grow literally all of their own talent. And I think uh, Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe and guys like that, they're going to be the last breed of this. If NXT continues to be as successful as it is now, it's going to be hard for anybody, you know, to get on the map or make a name for themselves outside of the WWE. And if they do, they're probably going to want to go to NXT. I just think when it comes to NXT, WWE is doing everything right. I really like what I see from them and I really like what I hear from all of you because everybody that I've ever talked to or interact with on Twitter, on Facebook, on my YouTube channel, you guys have nothing but positive things to say about NXT. I haven't heard one negative thing about it at all. So my hat's off to the WWE and the talent roster in NXT for putting on one hell of a show and I cannot wait to go through and watch some of these matches in their entirety. But I gotta say I'm really excited for Samoa Joe coming in. I never thought he was WWE material. I really didn't. It wasn't until NXT got on the map that I started thinking to myself, wow, he could actually go to the WWE now because this is the stage that Samoa Joe would be perfect on. Considering all the places he's gone before, he'd fit right in in NXT. So the fact that he's there and he's launched right away, right into the main program with their champion in Kevin Owens, I think is going to be big, mean big things for 
NXT, and I'm happy. I hope it translates into some awesome wrestling. So that's about all I can say about NXT Unstoppable, because like I said, I didn't see the show in its entirety, and I don't want to comment too much about something that I did not see. But I have to say, so far, it is getting rave reviews. As far as what else I'm going to talk about, we got to get into Payback, we got to get into Monday Night Raw, and we have to get into the Elimination Spaceship. Let's start with Payback. Did I not predict the shit out of this pay-per-view or what? I got every single match on the main card right. Seven for seven. I think I got the pre-show match wrong with the Mega Powers losing to the Ascension, but everything else I got right, starting with the main event, Fatal 4-Way, WWE title, Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, and champion Seth Rollins. Best part of this match, actually best part of the entire show, was the triple power bomb by The Shield onto Randy Orton onto the announce table. Awesome. I don't know if I've marked out that hard since SummerSlam. That was awesome. And it was WWE's way of teasing the fans, just kind of getting an idea. How are they going to react to a potential Shield reunion? The fans lost their mind. I cannot wait until one day when this faction reforms, because you know it'll happen. I think we're a solid year away, at the least, from it happening. But at least now, with the WWE doing what they did at Payback and the fans' reaction to it, you know the WWE took notice, and you know they've got that on the back burner, and they can always put that fact back together someday in the future and I cannot wait till that happens I even mentioned on Twitter weeks ago uh, something something along the lines of you know Brock Lesnar he signed a three year deal again with the WWE we know he's going to be in and out so that means in between stints with the WWE they got to write him off a of TV so I hope someday in the future the way they write him off of one of his little vacations that he's going to go on or one of his little hiatuses I hope they write him off TV by having the shield beat the shit out of him how awesome would that be it was so good to see the shield reunite even if it was only for 10 seconds and that was pretty funny Seth Rollins is really into it he's like yeah and he's trying to do the shield little fist bump thing and Ambrose and Reigns are looking at him like he's crazy and then they attack him and kick the crap out of him and Seth Rollins escapes the match like I knew he would and he won with the pedigree of all things I guess he has no finishing move anymore because that one weird DDT that he used, I don't know if that's necessarily his new finisher. And, of course, he's not doing the curb stomp anymore. So he hit the pedigree on, I think, Randy Orton. I can't even remember who he pinned, but he won the match with the pedigree, and Seth Rollins held on to the title just like I knew he would. He needs to. He's not going to drop this title yet. He'll keep it through the next pay-per-view as well. And I will get into predictions uh, for the next pay-per-view, actually, because I will not be up here for the go-home Raw to Elimination Chamber because that's Memorial Day. I've got big plans there, so I'm probably just going to skip a comment commentary altogether and come up and give an EC reaction video maybe next Sunday night. The only other really big match that took place on Payback, of course, was the I Quit match between John Cena and Rusev. A lot of chatter on social media about this, not surprisingly. Deluxe Man was all up my ass about it, like I give a fuck. John Cena, of course, wins. I had no doubt that he would. I picked him right from day one. The anti-hero, the you know anti-American guy is not going to win in this situation. Going up against John Cena, I pointed out all sorts of different reasons why the WWE is better off, quite frankly, having the title on John Cena because the open challenge is fun. So that's that right there was a good enough reason to not have Rusev win because putting the U.S. belt back on him at this point, you know, kind of what's the point? So my biggest concern was what kind of finish were they were going to do. The only thing I asked for from the WWE, I didn't care if Cena was going to win. I just wanted to make sure that the finish was not too ridiculous. And it actually wasn't. I did not like the move. I thought the STF with the fucking rope around the eyes was just dumb. It didn't look like it even hurt that bad. You know, why don't you take the guy's head and put it underneath the tire of a truck and say, I'm going to run you over. Over, you say I quit. Or grab a chain. I mean, basically, he used the same move on Rusev that Rusev used on him when he caught him backstage and wrapped the chain around his face. Remember that? At least bring a chain out there. All he did was put the ring ropes around Rusev's eyes, using that to pull back on his STF. And to me, I'm like, yeah, that probably is quite uncomfortable, but I don't know if that's going to make a guy like Rusev say I quit. So I thought the move that was used to end the match was stupid. Now, as far as the finish goes and how they did it, I have no problem with it. I know a lot. A lot of people fucking freaked out. I don't see what the big deal is. We knew Lana was going to have was going to play a role in this thing. There was no doubt about it because they've been teasing all of this. The fans are into her. Rusev's been giving her shit lately. They've got some dissension. She's fucked up a couple of times. So naturally, they're going to put her baby face 
Rusev's going to turn on her or do something. And you knew she was probably going to play a role in the outcome of the match. And the only thing I wanted from WWE was not to make Rusev look like too much of a bitch. I did not want John Cena to beat him clean in the middle of the ring. Rusev screaming, I quit. And then on top of that, he loses his woman at the same time. I did not think that was going to do Rusev any favors. But the way they did it, Cena's got that dumbass rope around his eyes. And and Rusev's just blabbering in fucking Bulgarian or Russian or whatever the fuck. And Lana finally grabs the mic and says, he's saying he quits, he quits, he quits. So I can live with that because Rusev probably was saying he quits and Mike Kyoto doesn't speak Russian or Bulgarian or whatever. So he didn't know that. And Lana had to come in and translate. Rusev speaks English. We've heard him cut some promos. He could have screamed, I quit, but this is a way to where it can be a little shady. You know, Rusev for the rest of his career can claim that he never said, I quit. He can claim that forever. If any of my listeners speak whatever language he was screaming, you can tell me what he really said, but he can go on forever saying he never said I quit. So that's all I wanted. I wanted them to slightly protect Rusev a little bit and not make him look too bad. And I don't subscribe to the theory that that losing to John Cena is going to completely kill his career. There's nowhere to go but down from here. After Cena, who does the guy work with? Undertaker? The Rock? Triple H? I mean, that's all that's left as far as, you know, moving up. He's not going to be in the world title picture right now because the world title picture is a mess. There's no room for Rusev. So just keep him where he is. I don't think they're going to do to Rusev what they did to Kozlov or Santino. I don't think it's like that. I think this is a different situation. I don't think Rusev is ever going to be Damian Sandow. I think Rusev is going to be a solid, believable performer on their roster on the mid-card level, and that's probably all he's ever going to do. Maybe a world title shot here or there at some point. Maybe a babyface run. Maybe even a a tag team with someone. Uh, If he fizzles out and the WWE has to maybe reboot and think of new ideas for him, he can definitely do some time-killing feuds that we seem that we we might feel might be pointless or something here or there, uh, but I don't think his feud with Cena really harmed him that bad. He's going to be on the roster forever. Two years from now, he'll still be there getting Intercontinental and U.S. title shots. Speaking of the Intercontinental title, he's getting the shot. He's going to be in the Elimination Chamber, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Raw and Payback mixed here because since we're on the subject of Cena and Rusev, why don't we just fast forward over to Monday Night Raw. Rusev comes out, and he's all pissed off, and he gives Lana shit, and he I guess they, they break up or whatever. And then later on, during a Dolph Ziggler match after he beats Stardust, I think, he's getting interviewed in the ring, and Lana comes out to the ring and then plants a huge kiss on him. So WWE, they're just moving on right to the next thing here. And like I said, to back up my point about Rusev, you know, everybody was thinking this guy was just going to be completely killed and buried after his match with John Cena. No, they moved right on. On Monday Night Raw, he's he's feuding with another guy that's right on the top of the roster. It's going to be Rusev and Dolph now with Lana mixed into this thing. So Rusev has pretty much moved on to his next feud. So did John Cena, as we saw on Monday Night Raw. So as far as what happened to Rusev, you know, I I didn't mind the finish because we saw it coming. We knew it was going to be Lana. We knew there was going to be some bullshit. And we knew it was going to be shady. I just didn't want Rusev to look too bad, and he didn't, because now he can always say, I never said I quit, and we'll never really know, and all that shit. WWE did their best to protect him under the circumstances. He was not going to beat John Cena, so if he was not going to beat him, this might have been the only way to do it. Either this, or like I mentioned last time in my last commentary, maybe have him pass out, you know, because he just can't take the pain anymore, and he loses consciousness, so Cena wins. Or have Lana throw in a towel, or some shit like that. They went with this, they went with him blabbering in another language and then Lana comes in and translates and the match is over and the very next night on Raw Rusev starts a feud with another top tier talent so I don't think uh, Rusev is going to be too much worse for the wear there was nowhere to go but down uh, after working with John Cena like I said he's either got to work with Taker or Rock or somebody on that level otherwise he's going to take a step back regardless of whether or not he wins or loses in this feud and it should make the Intercontinental Championship match in the Elimination Time Machine quite interesting especially if Dolph Ziggler wins which is kind of what I think might happen. I'll get into my predictions in a minute, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Let's rewind now, back to payback, as far as the other matches that took place on the card. I did pick Sheamus to beat Dolph Ziggler, and how about him getting busted open? Holy shit, it looks like he uh, headbutted Sheamus, and immediately his face was a crimson mask, as Gordon Soley would say. It was almost instantaneous. I laughed at people who thought he bladed. I'm like, no, he didn't. Just watch the fucking footage. He hit Sheamus with one hard headbutt and split himself wide open. And I don't know about you, but it looked like they went home early. As soon as that happened, you know, Sheamus had him pinned and it was over. It was so much blood. Neville, of course, got the victory over Bad News Barrett. I think at a count out. And then he ended up kicking his ass at the end. The New Day uh, retained the tag team titles, which I was happy about because I didn't want to see them lose the belts yet. 
Tamina and Naomi beat the Bella Twins like I thought they would, and Ryback got pinned by Bray Wyatt. Now, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but was that a one-off? Is that it? Just one match between those guys? I'm fine with that because I wasn't looking forward to the feud as it was, but it's like Bray Wyatt was cutting promos for like three or four weeks on Ryback. They have one match, he beats them, and they're done. Not a horrible match either. I actually like the finish where the turnbuckle pad came off and Bray threw Ryback ribs first right into the corner and then hit him with Sister Abigail. It was nice. I actually enjoyed a good portion of that match. All in all, payback, I don't know, what do you think? C plus, B minus, maybe something like that. I don't see how you can give it lower than that, uh, but I also don't see this thing getting an A either. All in all, I was about as satisfied as I could have been with payback. Now, as it pertains to Monday Night Raw, we'll rewind again and talk back about Seth Rollins and the authority and all of that. The authority is back. Stephanie and Triple H come back to open up the show and announce that Seth Rollins is going to have, I don't know, they're going to have some sort of like Seth Rollins appreciation night that's going to be what was it called like architect of a dream or some shit like that that's going to be the main event and as we saw in that main event dean ambrose comes in and interrupts and forces the authority to give him a title shot against seth rollins at the pay-per-view which absolutely thrills me i love that they're keeping dean ambrose on this level instead of like the intercontinental level i'm glad he's getting a title shot he's not going to win but i'm still glad he's getting a title shot those two guys have a lot of history their matches have been good they had a great match a couple of weeks ago on monday night raw their hell in the cell match last Last year wasn't half bad. I think these guys can do a really good job at the pay-per-view and have a good, solid match, and it's yet another opponent and another situation for Seth Rollins to escape with the title. This is exactly what he needs to do and the exact type of matches he needs to have to keep his title reign going. So they're not going to have a whole lot of time to build for this because next week is the go-home show, but they don't need it. There's plenty of uh, built-in storyline with the two of those guys, and I have no problem with Dean Ambrose getting the title shot. I'm actually quite happy about it. Now, also, getting back to John Cena and Rusev and all of that, I mentioned how Lana came out and interrupted Dolph Ziggler and started making out with him. That seemed to me like it made no sense. The WWE is just moving right along. They didn't give much of an explanation for it or anything, I'm guessing because they don't have time. They got a pay-per-view every two days here. So not only was the Cena-Rusev shit done at Payback, both guys had moved on and have completely different storylines and feuds now the very next night on Monday Night Raw. Ziggler and Rusev are obviously going to be feuding with Lana being involved and of course John Cena got a big surprise as well during his U.S. title open challenge on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Owens, the guy that we've all been hoping would eventually come out and challenge John Cena for that title, showed up. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved seeing him out there. I loved seeing him and John Cena face to face. I love the promo that Kevin Owens cut on John Cena. He was even like, hey, I've been doing this longer than you, motherfucker. You're not going to tell me anything. I'm not intimidated by you, and I'm quite frankly better than you. I love that attitude. Got right in John Cena's face. What I didn't like about it is I felt like it was rushed. This guy is in three feuds. He's got the title match, or he had the title match tonight at Unstoppable against Sami Zayn. Samoa Joe then showed up to kickstart what seems to be a few between the two of them and now Kevin Owens also has a match against John Cena for the U.S. title at WWE's next pay-per-view so Kevin Owens is a busy man and I have to give this a little bit of criticism because even though I'm happy that Owens is the guy that came out first of all it was the wrong town did you notice how dead the crowd was Richmond was not the city to debut Kevin Owens and have him come out in Monday Night Raw that shit needed to be in New York or New Jersey or Philly or Chicago or somewhere like that bringing him out when they did I think was a mistake And on top of that, I wanted to see him wrestle. I didn't want to see him come out there and cut a promo, even though his promo was awesome. And even though he beat the shit out of John Cena, which was also awesome, I wanted to see him come out to a huge pop and upset John Cena for the U.S. title, catch him off guard. Monday night would have been a good night to do it, even though the crowd sucked because John Cena just got through with a hellacious I quit match with a bona fide powerhouse the night before, somebody that took him to the limit. It seemed like he would be ripe for the picking. So if Kevin Owens was going to come out there, and challenge him, that would have been the night to do it. He could have actually beat John Cena for the title. They just had a promo, and they had Owens uh, powerbomb John Cena. All of that shit was great, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say anything bad about it. I almost wish, however, they would have waited. I wish they would have waited a little bit longer. I don't know three weeks before SummerSlam, have John Cena hold on to the belt all this time and then have Kevin Owens come out and challenge him and beat him. Now it seems like uh, we might be missing out on how great this feud can be because Owens is going to be hanging around NXT. He's still the champion over there and Samoa Joe made his debut tonight and they're going to be feuding so uh, this could be a one-shot deal for him and he's probably going to lose to John Cena which sucks. But it still has the potential to be good. I could be completely surprised by it. I just think with the anticipation with all of the fans kind of wanting and smelling that Owens 
Reigns could be the guy that eventually does come out and challenge John Cena. I think the WWE kind of dropped the ball on it. I think they should have waited a couple of more weeks or wait for the right town or the right moment or something like that. This seemed hot-shotted which I really didn't like. But they have a big match together on the next pay-per-view and not a bad debut for a guy like Owens. I mean, at least the WWE takes this guy seriously. At least they know, okay, this guy has had a lot of success on the independent level. If we bring him in, let's put him with Cena. That's pretty good. That's not typical Vince. Vince usually likes to have these guys start out at the bottom, especially guys that made their name away from him. For a guy like Owens, who wrestled where he wrestled and actually looks like he does. He's not even a big muscular guy. He's kind of a fat fuck. They're coming out there and they're putting him with Cena. And this is what I'm talking about. Didn't I mention this a couple of weeks ago? This is what they need to use Cena for now. Cena is not going to be wrestling for that much longer. So this next generation of stars, the Sami Zayn's, the Neville's, the Kevin Steen's, they need to get some ring time with John Cena. That way, one day when they look back at their career, they can say, I was in the ring with the poster boy of an era. And that's going to look really good in their autobiography or in their documentary DVD or whatever the fuck. And they're planning for the future to have Cena in this role to me, is a positive thing. But I'll talk a little bit more about that match when I give my predictions for the pay-per-view, so hang tight on that. Now, as far as what else we saw on Monday Night Raw, I mentioned the authority came out in the beginning of the show, Stephanie and Triple H. They were interrupted by Sheamus and Ryback, who both want to have an opportunity to be in the Elimination Hadron Collider. Stephanie and Triple H basically grant them both their wish. They're both in, but not before they have a match with each other, and Sheamus beat Ryback in that match as well. So Ryback is on a losing streak, and Ryback might actually be my Cinderella. I'm not picking him to win, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Maybe they put a few losses on him, and he can come out and win the Intercontinental title. WWE seems like they desperately want to do something with Ryback, but just nobody gives a shit about him, so hell, give him the Intercontinental title. Give him a big victory in a big multi-man match like this. You know, it, it could help him out a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if Ryback actually won the Intercontinental title. I also wouldn't be surprised if Rusev won it, but I'm jumping the gun here. It's not time for predictions yet. Bray Wyatt worked with Dean Ambrose as well. A really good match. J&J Security interrupted in that, helping Bray Wyatt win and beat Dean Ambrose, which I really liked. Neville and Barrett also had another match on Monday Night Raw. Barrett beats him, and then Bo Dallas, who's out doing commentary, uh, jumps in the ring and starts attacking Neville. So now these guys are going to feud together, which is great because they've got some history from NXT. So these guys, you know, I'd like to see them. I I like Bo Dallas. I've mentioned he's fucking hilarious. I like his pedophile voice. He sounds so fucking creepy. But if he got just a tiny bit more serious, you know, and him and Neville can maybe have a good feud because so far, Bo, everything Bo Dallas has done since he's come onto the main roster has been a joke. That should end now because now they've got an opportunity to have some really dynamite matches together. And I'm excited to see what these two guys can do. So as far as Payback and Monday Night Raw goes, I guess that's really all I have to say about them. We've got a couple of new feuds and we have a pay-per-view coming up in 10 days. Shit is moving really, really fast. Also, much to my delight, the WWE announced the return of Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast on the WWE Network. And guess who his guest is going to be? Paul Heyman. These guys have already done a podcast together. Austin's already had him on a show once and it was great and this is going to be on the WWE Network this is going to be good I'm really happy about that and I'm glad to see Austin has mended whatever fences he needed to mend with WWE there was a lot of rumors uh, that he was bumped from WWE Network in favor of Jericho and you know and all sorts of other you know there, there might be a little bit of heat between him and Vince and other people or whatever the fuck so I'm glad to see if anything was there it's been smoothed over but I have a feeling there was never anything there to begin with you know what they should do you know what would be funny they should have Chris Jericho and Stone Cold do a joint podcast on the WWE Network where they interview each other. How funny would that be? Also, did you guys hear about Sonny possibly uh, signing an adult film contract to do some porno movies? That would have been the greatest news I would have ever heard if it was 1996, Uh, but unfortunately it's 2015, and I don't know if I'm really interested in seeing Sonny naked because she looks fucking disgusting. But if it was 20 years ago, I would buy all of her DVDs. Now that I've quickly breezed through all of that, the Paybacks, the Monday Night Raws, the Unstoppables, did my best to talk about that. I know, guys, I didn't see a lot of that, and I'm sorry for the uninformed opinions if I should have gone into more detail and did not, but it was just, like I said, a really busy week for me, and the WWE was throwing so much shit at us, I felt like I couldn't keep up. But we got another pay-per-view a week from this coming Sunday, Elimination Chamber. Right now, there's only four matches for it. I'm sure there could be another one or two booked 
And I don't even know, is, is this a two hour deal or is this three hour? I'm pretty sure it's going to be three hour. I don't know what they did for King of the Ring because I missed that as well. But I imagine it's probably three hours and they're going to add a couple of matches to this. But the four big ones are already announced. So whatever, they el- whatever else they announce for this, I, I really don't care who wins. So I'm just going to predict the four big matches. First of all, WWE title, Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose. Hands down, Seth Rollins retains the WWE title. I predict him. United States title on the line. John Cena challenged by Kevin Owens. This should be a really fun, good, interesting match because if the fans that are so hung up on John Cena can put out of their mind that he might win for a minute, they should be excited to see these two guys in the ring together. I'm not very knowledgeable in my independent wrestling, but I do know for a fact Kevin Steen in Ring of Honor and all the other places that he's worked, a lot of people would have always have always wanted to see him face John Cena, especially cut a promo on him or something like that. We got that on Monday Night Raw, and in 10 days we get the first match between the two, and I'm kind of excited to see that. I have to pick a winner, though, right? At this point, when you look at it on paper, I'm picking John Cena. You you think that you have to because with everything that Kevin Owens has going on, where does the United States title fit into this? Why would he even win that belt at this point in time? Like I said, I think it would have been much better to debut Owens a few weeks from now, maybe a couple of months from now, have him come out there and surprise John Cena and beat him for the title on Raw in the U.S. title Open Challenge. I want to see John Cena lose during the Open Challenge, and I think that's when he will lose it. He will not lose it at the next pay-per-view. So I'm picking John Cena to defeat Kevin Owens only because of the situation. It's not one of those things where I'm like, oh, Cena needs to win and I'm going to defend it. It's not like that. It's because of how the WWE did it. They hot-shotted the whole thing and I think they're doing the match too early. However, now that I actually say the words and I'm listening to what I'm saying, I might actually change my prediction. You know what I would like to see? I'd like to see a no decision. How many times do you hear that? You actually want to see there not be a legit finish to the match? I think that might be the best way to go. Maybe you could even have Samoa Joe get involved in this thing. I don't think he would, but it's possible. But what I'd like to see is maybe maybe Kevin Owens finds himself on the ropes. He feels like he's about to get beat. He snaps. He goes and gets a chair, and he parts Cena's hair with it. Maybe what I would like to see is Kevin Owens and John Cena not have a definitive winner. Maybe it's a double disqualification or a countout or something like that. Kevin Owens goes back to NXT, does what he needs to do with Samoa Joe, and that leaves the door always open for him to come back into WWE and resume his feud with Cena. So what I would like to see at the Elimination Empire State Building is for John Cena and Kevin Owens to just have a schmoz. And maybe Kevin Owens leaves John Cena laying again just like he did Monday night. Or maybe there's a double DQ when Kevin Owens retreats up the stage to live to fight another day or something like that. But I think that might be the better answer to this match is just to not have a pin or submission have it end some other way that way these guys can resume their feud whenever wwe wants to pick it back up now like i talked about earlier the vacant intercontinental title will be defended in the elimination superdome i think there's six competitors in this r truth wade barrett dolph ziggler rusev ryback and sheamus if i'm not mistaken so in this it's a situation where anybody could win this thing when you look at all of those guys the only one i'd really rule out is our truth and i hate to say that because i really do like our truth and i wouldn't even mind if they swerved us and gave him the belt he's never been the intercontinental champion all those other guys have held the belt like 10 times each actually that's not true because rusev hasn't held it and uh, i don't think ryback has either so there's some guys that could be a first time intercontinental title holder but i'm going to go with my instincts on this and i'm going to pick dolph ziggler only because i think his feud with rusev is going to continue and i think if they were feuding for the intercontinental title that would ease a lot of fans minds and saying, oh, Rusev really got fucked over by John Cena because no, he was feuding for the U.S. title. Now he's feuding for the Intercontinental title. What's the difference? And the matches him and Ziggler can have can be pretty good. But with that being said, you know, maybe my Dolph Ziggler uh, prediction doesn't hold water either because do those guys need the title to feud if Lana is involved? There's already a storyline in place there. She's got the hots for Ziggler. She's making out with him. Rusev's losing his fucking mind. They can have plenty of emotion in this match and in this feud and in the storyline without having a title belt on the line but I think if Dolph Ziggler was to win and then feud with Rusev you know maybe Lana helps Dolph Ziggler win somehow maybe she fucks over Rusev maybe she's out on the outside of the ring and she does something to cost Rusev the match and have Dolph Ziggler win he becomes champion and then you line up what two or three pay-per-views in a row for these two guys to work so my prediction on this is basically going on what I want to see Ziggler winning the title would be great because I like Ziggler and it can set up a great feud with him and Rusev uh, with Lana in the middle and a title belt 
belt and all of that, and it doesn't make Rusev look like too much of a piece of shit after his program with Cena. Now, I also think a guy like Ryback could be a sleeper in this because we just saw him lose a couple of matches. He lost on Payback, and he lost the very next night on Raw. So nobody's expecting him to come out of this thing as champion. But the WWE, they try so hard to push him, and you know maybe a title belt is what he needs. Has he even held any gold yet in the WWE? Was him and Axel ever tag team champions? I don't think they were, although they might have been. That's how fucking bad my memory is. But for the best of my knowledge, this guy's never held a belt. So give him the Intercontinental title. So Ryback and Ziggler will probably be my odds-on favorite to win that match. But it could also be Rusev. I wouldn't mind seeing Rusev win. I would actually love it if Rusev won the Elimination Chamber and became Intercontinental Champion. Because if he did that, I think that would prove what I've been trying to say. Is that even though he came out on the losing end of his feud with Cena, that does not mean that he doesn't have a job anymore. There's no way you can work with Cena without taking a step down afterwards anyway, so as long as he's not out there in tag team matches with Fandango and Zack Ryder and shit, and he's still feuding for major titles, it goes back to exactly what I was saying, and that is, this guy just worked for six months. I mean, this shit really did kind of start at the Royal Rumble, did it not, between the two of them? So we're talking about nearly a half a year here that Rusev has been working with John Cena. He just comes off of that feud He's not going to be working pre-show matches, and he's not going to be fucking Damian Sandow or Santino Morella. I think they're going to take this guy seriously still, and if he is to win the Intercontinental title in this crazy-ass chamber match, I would be a very happy camper. So I guess those are my top three picks. Ryback, Rusev, Ziggler. But I got to go with my instincts, and I'm going to pick Ziggler, even though I'm probably wrong. Although I said that about payback, didn't I? Didn't I open my payback predictions commentary by saying, get ready to hear the worst pay-per-view predictions you've ever heard, and I got every fucking match right. So maybe I'll be right with this as well. The tag team titles will also be defended in the Elimination Hubble Telescope. You're going to have two guys in a pod? Are you kidding me? Is that what they're going to do? I guess I can't really complain about that because that's new. We've never seen that done before. Seems like it would get a little awkward in there. I hope nobody starts ripping farts or anything like that. And again, it's, it's one of these things where I mentioned it in my last commentary. I really trashed the Elimination Chamber. A couple people got mad at me and said, oh, the Elimination Chamber's great and it's unique and the matches have been good. Some of them have been good. I never debated that. I never said some of the Elimination Chamber matches we've seen in the past. I have never said they've all been bad. There have been some very, very entertaining ones. My point was, is the w- it's just such an over-the-top match and I don't like it when teams or guys are thrown into extremely violent matches for no reason. Doesn't mean I'm a pussy to the moron that fucking commented in my last video that completely misunderstood what the hell I was trying to say. As most people do who don't agree with me, they don't fucking listen. When I say it's violence for no reason, it is. Why would any of these tag teams have any reason to be in a violent, brutal match together? Who the hell wants to maim and kill Los Matadores or the Lucha Dragons? Why are these guys in such a bloody, brutal match? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Same goes with the Intercontinental title, for that matter. I always thought the Elimination Chamber, much like the Hell in the Cell, much like TL see a lot of these matches were ruined for me when they became pay-per-views i hate that we have a hell in the cell pay-per-view i hated that we had for so long an elimination chamber pay-per-view in february and the tlc pay-per-view in december that's fucking stupid you should be able to have these matches whenever a storyline angle or feud calls for them You shouldn't have to wait until October rolls around to say, oh, let's do a Hell in the Cell match. You should be able to do that at any show. Hell in the Cell should have taken place between Randy Orton and Seth Rollins at Extreme Rules. That's where the Hell in the Cell match should have happened. That was the big blow-off between the two of them. But no, they had to do a cage match because they can't do a Hell in the Cell match because there's a whole fucking pay-per-view dedicated to that match later on in the year. So I just don't like that you have to wait until December to do a TLC match or you have to wait until February to do an Elimination Chamber or October to do a Hell in the Cell. You know what I mean? To me, that just ruined the matches, and it made the matches meaningless and pointless. You've got 12 men in this tag team title match in the Elimination Chamber together. Why do they need to be in a chamber? If you want to give everybody a title shot, do a battle royal or something. To me, it's an Elimination Chamber match for the sake of having an Elimination Chamber match. There's no storyline that leads up to it. There's nothing that's been going on on TV that would make you think, wow, the only way to settle this issue between all of these tag teams is to put them in an Elimination Chamber. That 
that's where the match is okay. And I think that's where I was misunderstood. Even though I think the, the match is a ridiculous, obnoxious monstrosity that's way too big and way too overdone and way too fucking thought out. And every time I see that damn thing, it just looks so ridiculous. It's just so big and so over the top. I just don't like it. I've just never liked it. But at least if you have a reason for having the match, I'm okay with it. At least if there's a feud that calls for it. Like I said, with the hell in the cell. Don't just throw two guys in the fucking cell. Make the match mean something. So why the hell are these 12 guys in this Elimination Chamber match to fight for the WWE Tag Team title, uh, a set of belts that don't mean jack shit, that change hands every fucking two weeks, and whoever does come out of this match as the champions could very well lose at the very next night on Raw in a regular match anyway. So to me, it's pointless. It's just an attraction. The WWE is trying to, you know, sell some pay-per-views, sell some network subscriptions, whatever. It doesn't need to be done, and I've just, I'm just not really a big fan of this. But at least there is a vacant title on the line, and at least the Elimination Chamber is going to decide the inner continental title but the tag team titles we already have champions new day let me ask you this is all three of them going to be in that little pod together do they all get to work probably not i'm assuming only two of them do and if you've noticed recently too kofi and xavier woods have been switching with each other and if i have to predict a winner i want the new day to win that could be huge for them you know if they win a match like this in that environment you know especially if it's brutal hard hitting and hard fought and they are able to score a victory uh that could really help get them over a little bit more i think it could do a lot for other teams teams too, but could you really see Los Matadores or Lucha Dragons winning the title in that situation in the chamber? Why would they even do that? Kid and Cesaro would be the only other options, if you ask me. You know, maybe the Ascension, you know, if they want to start building those guys again, maybe the Ascension could score the big win here and win the WWE titles in that match. That wouldn't be too horrible. I know a lot of people hate the Ascension. I'm not a big fan of them either, but it could be a good way to launch them. But right now, New Day's the champion, and they're relatively newly crowned champions as well. So I would like to see them hang on to the title and win and escape uh, much with the same way Seth Rollins has been escaping all of his title matches lately I, I would like to see the new day do something similar I'm guessing we're going to have a Divas match on this pay-per-view as well, probably involving Paige and Nikki and, and Tamina and, and Naomi, most likely. Wouldn't be surprised at all if we got Neville versus Bo Dallas either or something like that. So, you know, the pay-per-view could surprise us. It's just one of these things. It's in two weeks. It's in ten days. Two weeks after the other one. It's too fast. It's too much. And if you noticed on Monday Night Raw, they had to build both of those matches in the same night. As a matter of fact, one of them was built in one segment I don't think any teams were announced for the tag team title match until that one tag team segment where all of them ran out there and started fighting with each other. I mean, you talk about rushing something. Holy shit. Same goes with the Intercontinental title match. All the participants were named on Monday night. So fuck the buildup. WWE didn't really have time to build any matches or to have qualifying matches or anything like that because there's not enough Raws or SmackDowns in between now in the Elimination Chamber to make that happen. So they just went ahead and announced everything uh, on Monday Night Raw. A few things happen on SmackDown and then they'll set everything up all nicely on this Monday's Go Home Show, which probably won't even that get that great of a rating because it's a holiday. So I don't know. To me, there's just an awful lot going on right now. It just seems like with Payback and then NXT Unstoppable three days later and then Elimination Chamber ten days after that, not to mention Raws and SmackDowns and, and NXT debuts. You know, Owens on the main roster, Samoa Joe on the NXT roster. There's so much going on. It's moving so fast. This week in my head was a huge clusterfuck. So I sincerely apologize if this commentary did not give you what you wanted as far as me talking in detail a lot of, about a lot of these things. And it even went shorter. I'm just about done here. And this commentary has not gone nearly as long as I thought it would. I thought for sure I would talk a lot longer than an hour. And I'm not even going to approach an hour. So I guess I'm going to reluctantly sign off. Just to recap what you can expect from me in the next couple of weeks. Like I said, there will probably not be a Raw review this Monday. It's Memorial Day. I've got a lot going on. I probably will not even bother reviewing the show. If a lot of things happen, maybe I'll come up with an updated Elimination Chamber predictions video, but I doubt I will even do that. This pay-per-view came so quick, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time predicting it and trying to figure it out because it's a, a quick pay-per-view, a throwaway pay-per-view. I hate to use that term all the time. But this one really does feel like it's a throwaway pay-per-view. It's uh, put together solely, I think, for the purposes of the WWE Network and to get a few subscribers on board following their month-long free trial that they've been doing or whatever. But just like Payback, maybe the Elimination Chamber can come off well. It can surprise us. And the WWE, the last few shows have been good. Payback was not horrible. NXT Unstoppable, from what I heard, was fantastic tonight. And in a few days, I'm sure all the boys will put on a hell of a show at the Elimination Chamber. I just hope it's good. I have no doubt we're going to see some really innovative shit most 
most likely in the tag team elimination chamber match. You know the Lucha Dragons are going to be climbing all over the fucking place. Los Matadores will probably be doing the same thing. And uh, the Intercontinental title match should have a spot or two that should be pretty fun to watch as well. So even though I'm not really a fan of the elimination spaceship, I will give the pay-per-view a chance. And I'm hoping that we see some really good things. So thank you for sticking around and listening to me and my casual, random-ass, half-informed opinions about what we've seen on WWE TV in the past few days. I apologize I didn't go into more detail about it, but I will get my shit together after Elimination Chamber and after everything just settles the fuck down. The WWE decided to give us three pay-per-views in a two-week span that just happens to be extremely busy for me, and I wasn't able to keep track of it the way I wanted to. But leave me all your opinions, leave me your predictions, tell me what you think about Kevin Owens and John Cena and Payback and Elimination Chamber and NXT TakeOver and all that shit. Tell me about all of it. I would love to know where some of you guys stand on some of those issues as it compares to mine. So we're probably looking at over a week until you hear from me again. I don't plan on coming up until after the pay-per-view, but there always is a chance uh, that you might hear from me a little bit sooner. So stay tuned to the Good Mike Work channel and all of my shit on social media for all the updates on that. You guys have a great week. Take care of yourselves, and I'll I'll talk to you very soon. Peace.